Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OODALOOP.com. Hello, I'm Bob Gorley, the Chief Technology Officer of OODA LLC. Today on the OODACast, James R. Clapper. Jim Clapper served as the fourth U.S. Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, for the United States. Uh, This is the top intelligence position. He did so in the Obama administration from 2010 to 2017. He began his career as an enlisted Marine Corps reservist in 1961, serving in a wide range of uh, operational intelligence positions after that in the U.S. Air Force. He eventually became a three-star Air Force Lieutenant General and the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. After retiring from uniformed service, he would later return to government as the first civilian director of what was at the time the National Imagery and Mapping Agency. This was just three days before 9-11. In 2007, uh, General Clapper was named the Pentagon's top intelligence official, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, and serving as an appointee in both the Bush and o- Obama administrations before President Obama appointed him to the DNI. He's author of the book, Facts and Fears, Hard Truths from a Life in Intelligence. General Clapper, welcome to the UDACast. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. And uh, may I, at the outset here, commend what you do. Uh, I'm an avid reader of uh, UDA Loop, and uh, I really love it. Sometimes I don't completely understand it because it's pretty techy, but uh, it's a a great publication. I'm an avid reader of it. Well, thanks for the endorsement. It really um, makes us want to do more and better. Uh, We're very proud that we try to cover the waterfront of issues and risks globally. And knowing that you're an avid reader is uh, very motivational for us. Well, thanks. Anyway, thanks for having me. Well, I'd like to start with some uh, discussion about your book, if that's okay, because... uh, Oh, sure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Facts and Fears, Hard Truth from a Life in Intelligence. Let me tell you what I liked about it. I liked the way you started the book um, at the beginning. Um, uh, you're a very young age. You're, you were essentially born into intelligence. That was the title of one of the chapters of your book, my favorite chapter, because it connected us to history. It connected us to the history of World War II and uh, the age uh, right after. It connected us to the Cold War and uh, your parents. We learned more about them uh, and their actions. And uh, your dad was an uh, Army signator. And so I really liked that book and wanted to commend you for starting at the beginning. For a history buff like me, that's just a great hook to, to want to learn more. Well, thanks, uh, Bob. It was, uh, I uh, wasn't going to write a book. I sort of got talked into it and uh, by my collaborator, Trey Brown, who was my uh, speechwriter the last three years I was DNI. And we kind of mind melded. And he really uh, talked me into writing a book. and. Uh, and helped me a lot with it. I never got it done without him. And I found it to be both a cathartic as well as an opportunity to be contemplative. And, and one of the things that I realized fully was the extent to which my parents, particularly my dad, influenced me and you know, in my uh, career and you know, whatever success I enjoyed is a huge influence by him. Right, and it was pretty clear in the book that um, you learned at an early age the importance of uh, keeping secrets. Um, there's things that you didn't talk about because you knew your dad was involved in secret things. Well, it's true, uh, although it's hard not to absorb uh, a bit about uh, the work he, he was in. And I guess I, I, I kind of got into it a bit during my senior year in high school and in which I uh, attended a dependent high school in, in uh, West Germany, uh, Nuremberg American High School, which doesn't exist anymore. My dad was the operations officer for a very large, uh, what was then called the Army Security Agency uh, Signal Intelligence Battalion, uh, targeted against uh, East Europe. And, uh, you know, I hung out with uh, some of the soldiers that uh, worked for my dad because uh, they're only a couple years older than me at that point. And, uh, you know, kind of through osmosis, uh, I, I learned some things. I learned a lot about communications theory from one of these, a uh, couple of these guys who were ham operators. And I'd go hang out with them and they taught me a lot about uh, propagation theory and 
uh, communications work. And of course, that was the heyday of high frequency manual Morse, and one of the man, um, Morse code. So I, I didn't get the uh, the full money exactly, but I certainly had a uh, exposure to it, I'll put it that way. And mm -hmm. I, that's what kind of motivated me later. That's cool. And I did want to mention, uh, you mentioned Event Hill Farms in your book, uh, Army SIGINT Station, which um, I live pretty close to that. And frankly, um, I'm embarrassed to say I had never visited there until I read your book and then was motivated to go see it. There's a Cold War museum there now that's full of great gear from the Cold War, including uh, devices that maybe they're the same that your father had used. Uh, so it's a pretty good facility. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's, uh, I've been back a couple of times. In fact, I, uh, when my dad, not too long before he died, I, I took him out to Ben Hill. We, it was a trip down memory lane for both of us and the, um, the quarters that we lived in, which in those days was a fourplex with four lieutenants living in it. It's now that they converted into a duplex. And uh, since it, it, was, it was a farm when the army uh, took it over in, uh, in, the, in the early forties and the propagation conditions there are, uh, are very suitable for long range uh, SIGINT operations. So that, that's what drove the choice. And the operations themselves were actually conducted in what used to be the barn. In fact, that's what it was referred to as the barn, which actually meant operation. And that barn, uh, as far as I know, is, uh, is still there as well. That's cool. Can we fast forward and talk a bit about your early years as an intelligence professional um, in Vietnam? Well, uh, I, uh, when after I got commissioned, I went to uh, Goodville Air Force Base, which in those days was purely uh, SIGINT uh, training, both officer and enlisted. And that, it was uh, the, the Air Force cryptologic arm was the US Air Force Security Service, and that, that base was owned by security service. So it, exclusively for SIGINT training. It's since, since broadened it. All skill sets uh, are trained there. So I went there and my first assignment, which was kind of a disappointment, was uh, to Kelly Air Force Base, 180 miles away. And I went there as, uh, and I was kind of, a, you know, most lieutenants, uh, second lieutenants, kind of an apprentice. And was there about uh, two years, I guess, or a year and a half, something like that. Two years, I, I was the first lieutenant. And then I went to, Volunteered to go to Vietnam, went early, uh, November 65, I, I went to North Vietnam and uh, it was probably the most miserable year of my life, both pers <clears throat> personally and professionally. And very, grew very disillusioned about the war and almost got out of the Air Force uh, after my year was up, uh, rotated back to Kelly and essentially uh, more or less the same kind of job I had when I left, but my intent was to finish my master's degree get out of the Air Force and go to NSA and do cryptograms the rest of my life. But somebody intervened, um, a mentor, although it, in those days that term wasn't used, but that's really what it was. And, you know, kind of plucked me out of anonymity and, uh, you know, started helping me with uh, assignments and, uh, you know, it was kind of the rest was history. But, uh, well, I was uh, pretty, uh, Narrowly, you know, avoided getting out of the Air Force. I was all, all but out. What well, now? You had an opportunity to brief people like General Westmoreland, correct? I did. Um, the arrangement. I was uh, when I first got to Vietnam. I was a watch officer, and I worked straight mids from uh, about ten o'clock at night to around eight o'clock the next morning. And uh, what was Second Air Division, later Seventh Air Force uh, Warning Center, which was nothing more than a an H1 van, a, a tractor trailer van. And we had, uh, you know, a teletype circuitry, uh, mainly uh, connected with uh, Air Force Security Service Unit, Zanang Air Base, that uh, tracked uh, Air, North Vietnamese air defense, which is in, in turn how we kind of monitored uh, air, our own uh, Navy and their uh, Air Force strikes up there. So I did that for about four months and then uh, became a, a day lady analyst, air defense analyst. And uh, again, was kind of plucked out of an anonymity from the sea of lieutenants there to go brief General Westmore on every Saturday on SIGINT reflections of airstrikes. Well, I had never even uh, seen 
uh, a, a four-star general, let alone actually talk to one. And uh, I was scared to death. You know, the first Friday night uh, before the Saturday morning, I was going down. But I was part of a, a, a two-man tandem, and uh, I I briefed in his office, uh, sort of a cloister, on what we saw in Sigan about uh, airstrikes over North Vietnam and. First time I did it, you know, I was scared to death. And then, you know, after about three or four Saturdays, I began to grow kind of disillusioned because, um, you know, just more, General Westmoreland didn't seem to have a great strategic vision about what he was trying to do other than body counts. Uh, he loved numbers. How many people have been killed? How many bridges knocked out? How many road cuts? How many truck explosions, et cetera, et cetera. He was big on numbers. But there didn't seem to be any you know, overarching vision, what are we trying to do here? And as time, as time went on, I started to see what it did to, what it was doing to the uh, armed forces, particularly the army, my dad's service. And uh, I just, over time, grew very disillusioned with war, like, what are we trying to do here? Right. You know, General, by the time um, I first saw you, um, you were very senior. I was very junior in the Navy, um, very joint, of course. And you were delivering a presentation where you were making a lot of points. This must have been like in 91, maybe 92. You must have been director of DIA. Right. And you talked about things like uh, what intelligence should be. And I remember it to this day. It's, uh, you said intelligence cannot be a self-licking ice cream cone, intelligence for intelligence sake. You also said that intelligence professionals should never be um, lulled into being historians, just reporting on things that have happened. Uh, we need to lean forward and be proactive and predictive. And I wonder, although I heard those kind of things from you near the end of your career, if your early formative days are where those kind of points were underscored for you. Oh, exactly, Bob. That's a great question and, and, and very perceptive. And it's precisely because Intelligence uh, was largely historical. It was very slow. Uh, you know, we would track uh, reactions to airstrikes through by monitoring North Vietnamese air defense communications, which were high frequency manual morse, very slow. And then, you know, acetate and grease pencil, we'd try to recreate the tracks. Well, by the time all that elapsed, um, you know, the uh, pilots are back at bases in Thailand having a beer and we're still trying to recreate these you know maps of what happened and intelligence was uh, in many cases was sort of entertainment at the at the briefing and it was rarely was it anticipatory or useful uh, for uh, you know decision makers now that's improved a lot uh, or you know in my time and the technology has, has gotten you know, faster and faster. We're able to move more and more volumes of data quicker. We have persistence in the form of RPVs. And there's so many uh, technological innovations that have profoundly changed the nature of intelligence. But um, you know, in those days, it was really slow. And as a consequence, the Air Force produced a generation of generals uh, three and four star generals who were captains and majors, uh, pilots in Vietnam who grew disillusioned with intelligence as well, not only because it was slow, but also because they felt that uh, we were hiding things behind the green door. We really weren't, but that was, that was clearly the image and uh, it took a long time for that um, culture, if you will, to wash out. Uh, of the Air Force. Right. You know, uh, since you mentioned him in your book, I want to mention uh, Rich O'Lear. Um, I thought you said some very favorable things about Rich, and I met Rich uh, years ago, and I have to tell you, he's one of the most forward-thinking uh, visionaries around. Um, spent a lot of time in the Air Force, um, and I know he's a personal friend of yours because you write about him in the book. I just wanted to say he is still pulling together insights uh, through a community of people focused on the future and has many of us now thinking, what's the future of technology and what impact will it have on the Intel community? And what does the Intel community need to do to continue to shift to be more relevant? So I think 
uh, he must be an example of the kind of um, general that we need more of in the Air Force. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Rich and I met um, as colonels and uh, we were on the air staff together uh, in, uh, uh, in the early 80s. And Rich, uh, if memory serves, graduated from the National War College. I think he graduated in 80 and I graduated in 79. And, and uh, you know, I, everybody's watching well, what, what's going to happen when these two hot burner colonels uh, get together. And initially, Rich was my deputy as I was chief of what was in the old days called INY on the air staff, which is all the programming and money and that sort of thing. And then Rich moved over to the other major directorate, which was the director of estimates, which attended to Southern Intel. And one would think, you know, we'd, we would be hot competitors. And what happened was uh, we became close friends. We carpooled uh, together. And uh, subsequently I went down to be commander of ABTAC. And then Rich, when I, when I left there and went to Korea, Rich succeeded me. And we've been lifelong friends ever since. And you're quite right in your characterization of Rich. He has unbelievable uh, energy and uh, even today it's, and, you know, we're both getting up there. But uh, Rich has a, a passion for uh, intelligence and um, its role in the national security apparatus and its importance to this country uh, that continues yet today. And he's, you know, he's been a leader, a thought leader, uh, I should say. Uh, with respect to intelligence. So I have great, uh, tremendous admiration and respect. And uh, as I say, we've been you know, lifelong friends since it's been now 40 years. Cool. Um, let me get back to this topic of intelligence in uh, history. I think uh, another thing that happened on your watch as you were director of national intelligence was the um, Osama bin Laden raid. Right. And I can only assume, based on what I've seen, that's an example of more proactive intelligence. That was not waiting to see what we discover. That was going out there and hunting for data and coming up with assessments and validating assessments and continuing to iterate. You well, know? Uh, you're quite right. And, and I have always highlighted the, um, uh, that, the takedown of UBL on the 2nd of May of 2011 as uh, you know, a, a real highlight uh, as opposed to a lot of lowlights, but that was, uh, and it was a textbook example, Bob, of uh, the partnership between intelligence and operations, in this case, specifically special operations. And uh, it's also a testament to persistence and not giving up, and patience, painstaking patience uh, to track down uh, the whereabouts of, of UBL. So it was, uh, you know, a, a real classic textbook uh, example. I, I always ha I have to acknowledge that uh, President Obama made a very courageous decision uh, to go ahead with uh, the raid and, and, and you know, there was a, a right up to the last minute debate about just how to conduct it, you know, standoff ammunition or a special ops operation. And he, um, you know, opted for, I thought the, the most promising option but also the one that carried probably the greatest political risk. Uh, but it, it, as I say, it was a, a tremendous uh, uh, example of the partnership that what can exist between operations uh, and intelligence. And I'll tell you, I'll never forget, uh, after being closeted in the White House Situation Room for 13, 14 hours that day, and the president was going to, when he finally had, he was pretty confident that it was UBL, and he was going to address the nation and a few of us went over to the Easter room where he gave the address. I'll never forget walking out the door and down the portico next to the Rose Garden. And when I opened the door, there was a, and of course, word had gotten out. There was a crowd chanting, USA, USA, USA. And boy, it really hit me uh, emotionally uh, what that event meant. It was closure for the country and certainly closure for the intelligence community and, 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 and for all of us in intelligence and closure person. Right. And so a couple of lessons there that you just underscored. One is, you know, I have seen um, intelligence and decision making being done separately in terrible ways. Um, that self-licking ice cream cone of intel. Um, and I have seen it work well together. And this right. is the classic example of working extremely well together um, and being proactive when it comes to intelligence. Um, 
what you just described about the UBL rate, I think underscores really well the importance of Ops and Intel working together. I've seen the opposite too. I've seen you know working separately uh, at uh, disastrous results. Um, but it also underscores the importance of proactive intelligence and leaning forward and collecting the right stuff um, and not being this historical reporter of information only, but you know, making some projections and calls. I want to mention another topic area where I think the Intel community needs a lot more work, and that is cybersecurity and the cyber threat. Um, I've tracked the Intel community in this domain since 98 when I got involved in it personally. I think they do wonderful work, but most of it seems to me now to be historical. Who attacked us um, last month and how do we attribute that? Very little, at least, is being seen commercially on um, who is going to attack next and what are their capabilities. The greatest sources of intelligence in cybersecurity, in my opinion, seem to be commercial. Companies like FireEye, who acquired Mandiant, they produce assessments, they're well read by everyone. Um, and that just has always puzzled me. Is there more that the intelligence community can do to better serve um, U.S. policymakers and also industry in America on what the nature of the cyber threat is? Can it be more proactive? Uh, let me uh, get back to a couple other things uh, uh, before I, I lose the thought here. First is on the, you know, the uh, self-licking ice cream cone metaphor, which is meant to um, imply or convey that the intelligence community should only do things that uh, the policy uh, community tells it to do. And by poli I'm policy writ large, whether military commander, diplomats, you know, whomever. And so that's why there's, a, there's supposed to be a, a rigorous process by which policy needs are expressed. And then that is translated in turn uh, by the intelligence community and, and its individual components into actual resources, um, capabilities, manpower, et cetera, uh, that are applied against uh, those priorities. So that, that, that's, a, that's an important point. I, I wanna make it, sh it shouldn't slip by. Okay. As far as cyber is concerned, um, yeah, um, the, there's no question there can be uh, improvement. I, I think, um, and there's a couple of uh, obstacles here, at least that I encountered. One was, um, of course, the, um, the is sharing and the, the obstacles to sharing. And both camps, whether the intelligence community on one hand and, and the commercial side on the other, do have uh, understandable uh, reasons why uh, there's a reticence to share. In the case of the intelligence community, of course, it's you know, the proverbial sources and methods and trade crime. And in the case of the commercial side, there's, there's uh, proprietary interests, you know, shareholders, boards, and that sort of thing that inhibit sharing. In fact, I was uh, part of a, an effort, or kind of dragged into it, uh, in the Congress to legislate uh, sharing. And I didn't, I didn't, didn't succeed. So there is, I think people have to understand what the reluctance is. The other thing that, that prevails that uh, certainly in the case of the solar winds uh, uh, attack, if you want to call it an attack, and actually it's a great espionage, is, um, you know, the restrictions on the use of the national foreign intelligence apparatus in the domestic context. No, that's, that's the way that's over the labor grade of the intelligence community, but something needs to be done about that. Uh, because the intelligence community, despite what some people think, is going to try to stay within the guardrails imposed by the law. And so there needs to be, I think, legislation on from two standpoints one that would promote sharing and uh, or mandate it, perhaps. And the other thing is. How can we bring to bear the resources of considerable resources, notably those of NSA, uh, in what could be a domestic context? And that's, uh, you know, having lived through Snowden, uh, that's a, a real point of sensitivity. And, and that's why the Congress uh, has got to act.
in my opinion, to improve this. All right, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. The other thing, one other point I'll make is, is um, uh, something we ran into during the Obama administration, it's probably different now, but um, you know, is the, the notion of responding to a cyber attack in kind. In other words, we get a cyber attack, we're gonna counterattack. Well, what inhibits that, I found, is if you do not know how the adversary that you're attacking is going to counter retaliate and whether or not you have the ability, you're resilient enough to absorb such a counterattack. Our approach traditionally has been to be very precise, surgical, and legalistic in the use of a cyber weapon. Well, you can't count on adversaries to be similarly precise, surgical, and legalistic. So those are all complications uh, that uh, enter into the fray here when you're trying to decide to do what to do about it. In, this, in these cases, uh, you know, the solar winds attack and the attack against Microsoft, um, which are just were great examples of espionage. All right, no, I agree. That makes a lot of sense. Um, although from the perspective of the company solar winds, that was an attack. Uh, it really hurt their bottom line and their business. From the perspective of the nation, that was done as a for an espionage purpose. Uh, I wanted to shift and ask your opinion on something else. Uh, you spent a career um, providing information to super busy people, uh, super busy decision makers. And I wanted to ask if you had any tips for us there, because I see that's still a challenge today, whether you're in government or in industry. You have a busy decision maker, an analyst has information they need to convey to that busy decision maker. Uh, any tips or advice on how to do that effectively? Well, uh, yeah, I got, uh, uh, I, I thought, you know, I was pretty good at that stuff uh, before I, I became DNI. Well, I got uh, come up and, but, uh, uh, President Obama, you know, I've never done a, a president before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously he was a, a really busy guy and also a very smart guy. And uh, I learned to cut to the chase, you know, uh, whether in the Oval Office or during meetings, um, where typically for principals committee meetings or National Security Council meetings that the president presided over. You know, you always start with, if it's a foreign problem, you know, you start with intelligence. Until I always liken it to, we're, we're there to be the throat clearers. And, uh, and what I learned was, boy, just cut away the uh, fluff. And what are the major points here? What are the top two, three, or four points I need to make? Because lots of other people are waiting to talk and they don't particularly appreciate you know, droning on and, you know, where you're trying to cut through the underbrush uh, to, to get what, what's the real point here. And that's, uh, you know, it's the old saw about, gee, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't have time to write a short message. And it's, um, it's much the same, you know, picking out what is, you know, from the piece of intelligence, what is crucial here? Should, should the president hear about this even, the first instance? And if he does, if he should hear about it, how are you going to portray it as succinctly and clearly and briefly as you can? Great, thanks. Very helpful, and I think relevant across multiple domains, not just intelligence, but you know, yeah. government and business. Uh, let me ask a related question. I um, I want to ask if you have any books that you would recommend for the busy CEO today. Um, what are you reading? Well, I, I'm big on history. Um, I'm a, like you, somewhat of a World War II um, history buff, and as well the Korean War. So I, that's what I, I, I now that I have a little more time. I, I dwell on those. So, you know, the, I guess from a management standpoint, I guess uh, I forget the author, but the Seven Habits of All Successful. Right. Uh, that's a that's a pretty good uh, uh, text. But the, the thing is, when I read these things, I always found them to be uh, exercises in writing down common sense. Uh, and that's something I learned from my dad about, uh, you know, what a great management tool common sense is and uh, how to treat people. Um, you know, and I, I learned that just by watching him. And it's not like he, you know, gave me sermonettes at the end of the duty day or something. 
uh, just the way he treated people, regardless of their station uh, in life. And it's something I carried with me. And I, I would assume that anyone I met was competent and wanted to do the right thing until uh, proven otherwise. And I, I think if you approach people that way, um, and it, a lot of times if you do, you'll help heighten their competence uh, just by treating them that way. And of course, you, you know, you gotta be alert to the ones that aren't. <laughs> right, right. You know, this brings up another a story from your book now that you mention it. It seems like um, your mom was also that way if I understand your book correctly, you recounted that you have a story, you were in Japan at an officer's club function, uh, integrated officer's club, but maybe not fully. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very memorable vignette and I'll explain to you why I, I remembered it. Um, yeah, it was 1952 and we were at uh, uh, well, Shitosi Air Base, which still exists and that's a jazzed out base. But in those days, the uh, the uh, Army's 1st Cav Division, which was a huge division that rotated out of Korea. And so there were three Army bases there. And then uh, my dad was the number two, he was an exo of a very small ASA detachment. And uh, so the Sunday custom, you know, the social life for officers, or particularly overseas, revolved completely around the officers club back in those days. And this is 1952, which was four years after Harry Truman had uh, issued an executive order in 1948, which legally, I guess I'll say, desegregated the military. So institutionally, uh, the, the military is supposed to be desegregated, but socially, certainly it was not. So the background was, was that uh, I had to go to the dentist and uh, which I didn't like, like most kids. And uh, the dentist I uh, went to was a lieutenant, um, a Harvard graduate, as a matter of fact, and a superb dentist. And he was great with me. And my mom really liked uh, his manner with me and all that sort of thing. So typically on Sundays, we had to go to Sunday brunch. And, uh, you know, all, all the officers in their uniforms and uh, the ladies all dressed up in their gloves and hats. And, uh, and of course, my sister and I, we had to get dressed up and go too. So for us, it was torture. So typically they'd have a Japanese band uh, doing its best to impersonate American popular music. And they had this big buffet and all that. So my mom and dad and sister and I, my sister, my younger sister and I were sitting there. The band took a break and uh, uh, you know, the room kind of grew quiet. And I think my mother intentionally waited for a moment like that to do what she did, which was to get up, walk across the room to the extreme periphery of, of this big dining room, dining hall in the officer's club and approach this lieutenant who was not surprisingly sitting by himself and took his hand and brought him to our table. Well, you could have heard a pin drop in that officer's club. All these, white officer, senior to my dad, my dad was a captain, uh, looking at her and then looking at him like, you know, can't you control your wife sort of thing. And I'll never forget the look on my dad's face about, uh, it was a combination of uh, admiration, amusement, and fear. And uh, so he, you know, we made room for him and he had, uh, had brunch with us. And the reason, Bob, I remember that vignette so vividly, and I, I think it affected me later on, is that typically my mother would talk incessantly about things, but she never said a word about what she'd done. And after we went home, we never had a little talk about why she did what she did. I don't know if my mom and dad talked about it. I assume they did, but out of my earshot. And I think because it was a message a compelling message to me, and it it was based on her action rather than anything she said. It's why I remember that, and I think that influenced my approach to equal opportunity and diversity and inclusion uh, later on. Right, and you know, to me, it's absolutely a story of leadership too. Your mom was demonstrating fantastic leadership character. Yeah, she was. Uh, 
what would have been, didn't use the term back then, but she was, she was a feminist. Uh, she had a couple of years of college and uh, she was very, uh, very assertive. I'll put it that way. <laughs> All right. Um, General, in our remaining time, can I ask you some questions about the geopolitical events? Sure. Because, you know, um, I may never get another opportunity in my life to ask General Clapper about uh, intelligence issues. And I would just really appreciate your thoughts on some things. So what is China? Um, if you look at what we've been writing about on OODA Loop uh, for the last several years, you know, China has continued to expand and they've been telling us what they want to do. They've been expanding their influence and they're doing it. But something seems to have changed. The um, 2019 to 2020, they um, intensified their actions in Hong Kong, and it's gotten to the point in Hong Kong now where they're just flat out arresting dissidents. Um, so Hong Kong has been totally decimated. Just the last few months this year, they have been increasing their rhetoric and actions against Taiwan. The rhetoric and verbal barrage comes from uh, people like Xi Jinping himself which has threatened the punishment of history for Taiwan's resistance to the Chinese Communist Party. In the South China Sea, um, things have been evolving there for a decade, but all of a sudden things are moving faster. With In the news today, there are swarms of uh, fishing and merchant ship armadas uh, moving into disputed waters, um, and including their Navy as well. Uh, there's also, of course, the continued and blatant uh, persecution of the the, 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 the Uyghurs. And I think something has changed. I believe it tracks back to this. Uh, oh, and of course, there's taking advantage of the global pandemic, we should say also, that's just happening. But the change seems to have occurred around the time when they decided they're not going to care what people think about Hong Kong. Uh, that's my thesis anyway, and would love your assessment on that situation. Well, I think this is not a uh, sudden overnight uh, development on the part of the Chinese. I think um, it's uh, become, frankly, more visible to us by virtue of uh, President Trump and the Trump administration really calling out the Chinese for what they are. And, uh, you know, which I, I completely agree with. I, I just didn't agree with doing, it, doing that unilaterally. But anyway, the Chinese have long suffered from what they call 100 years of humiliation. And they you know, never got over the, the colonial era and their uh, institutional inferiority. And I think what motivates implicitly uh, Chinese actions, Chinese behavior is recovering from that 100 years of humiliation. And so the Chinese have gradually become more and more assertive. And as we have turned inward, and consume ourselves with our internal divisiveness and polarization. And the Chinese have seen that. And what they've done is, is simply push the envelope, South China Sea, the Belt Road Initiative. And in, in the absence of pushback from us or others, they'll, they've just continued to push. And so, uh, you know, they've pretty much uh, Conquered, if, you, if that's the right word, Hong Kong, and certainly their uh, their moves, their rhetoric, and some of their exercises against Taiwan are very are threatening and and disturbing, and and uh, I I believe they're going to put it put us to the test, and they can back this by the strength of their economy, which is going to overtake ours soon as the largest economy in the world and their military modernization, which is quite impressive and disturbing. And that it is designed specifically against those capabilities which they feel are our strengths, our command and control, our reliance on space, our Western Pacific bases, carriers and carrier aviation. And they've built specific capabilities and weapon systems against those strengths. And they've been very skillful in exploiting other countries in their Belt Road Initiative, which is very exploitative and works essentially to the advantage of China rather than the client. And so that's created 
uh, a paralysis on the part of many countries that, that China is so exploited, particularly with respect to the economic control they have and influence, so that these countries are very reluctant to push back. And I've often, I've long said that uh, what would really have impact on China if ASEAN could speak with a unified voice against China's aggressiveness, but that's not gonna happen. And so now we're in a mode of the US with uh, you know, a few, you know, Japan and India and Australia. Well, that's, that's all good. Those are, you know, that's kind of a, a uh, stretched uh, coalition there, but uh, we've got to do things like that to, to push back against China. And I, I do worry about if they put us to the test with Taiwan, just what we'll do about it. Right. And um, this may be an unfair question for you, but I wanted to ask, do you have any advice for the business leader who may be doing business in China? Uh, a business leader, U.S. corporation doing business in China um, needs to be aware of these kind of things if they want to sell into China or use China as part of their supply chain or, or they face um, economic consequences for their business. And how does a CEO find balance there and well, trying to do business with China? I'm glad I'm not a CEO in that position because uh, I think they're in a very difficult position. There are obvious economic advantages to doing business in and with China. It's profitable. And, uh, you know, this is a big difference, obviously, between we and uh, the Russian or the Soviets and we and the Chinese, because in the case of the Soviet Union, well, those two economies are mutually exclusive. Well, that's not the case at all with the Chinese. So this gets very complicated. Now, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a, an American citizen, uh, it you know, gets my hackles up when I, I see, you know, companies doing business in China, which uh, because of the financial advantages, and making concessions to the Chinese uh, that complies with their uh, uh, tremendously oppressive suppression of their and control of their population. That's another thing that impels Chinese leadership is control of that, uh, that large population. They don't want to get it out of hand and they don't want uprisings and opposition or any of that sort. And so when we sort of cater to that, uh, that that's very bothersome, but I, at the same time, I, I recognize the uh, economic and financial advantages of doing business in China. You mentioned supply chain. Well, this is a nightmare kind of problem for uh, you know, intelligence and security uh, for, uh, entities in this country. And uh, you know, control, ensuring the fidelity of uh, our, our supply chain is a, a tremendous challenge. One of the things that makes me glad I'm not responsible anymore. Yeah. Um, can we turn to Russia for a minute? Sure. Um, another country we write about extensively at OODA Loop, and we track a lot of what's going on there, you know, frequently in the cybersecurity domain. But recently, there have been an increase in troop movements around the coast, uh, the border with the Ukraine, and a buildup in Crimea. Uh, it's gotten so concerning that uh, NATO has issued statements. The U.S. Department of Defense just uh, made an announcement uh, saying that Russia needs to make clear its intentions regarding a military buildup um, along Ukraine's southeast border and in Crimea. Seems like another crisis in the making. My first uh, wonder was, is it possible that Russia is creating a crisis at the same time China is moving in the South China Sea? Uh, is this somehow connected, um, both of them doing this because it's a period of weakness, or is it just two unrelated crises by two different players in the world? Well, I, actually, I don't know, but I, I, my uh, assessment is that there, it's, it's separate. It's related, I guess, from you know, the Chinese pressuring us in the Pacific and the Russians pressuring us in Europe. But uh, um, I think you know, this uh, partnership between the Chinese and the Russians is uh, somewhat a marriage of convenience um, because of the mutual adversary with us. Uh, but I think there are, are long standing, deep seated animosity between the Russians and the Chinese. And I could be wrong about this, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we're gonna 
uh, are bode well for a, a long-standing intimate and trusting relationship between those two. Russia is uh, in decline and were it not for its military capabilities, notably its nuclear arsenal, which represents the greatest mortal threat to the United States is, is Russia. And you have to respect that. Now, if it, if it weren't for that, well, you know, we wouldn't be so concerned about it. As far as the Ukraine is concerned, well, that was, you know, that was always the challenge in 2014. What exactly are the plans and intentions of the Russians, which means what are the plans and intentions of Putin? And, uh, you know, I'm sure that the intelligence community is struggling with that right now. What I hope we don't do is, you know, huff and puff, but not blow the house down. In other words, we just make statements, we just, you know, fire one when ready for a rhetorical volley. I'm not sure that's gonna, and if we don't back it up, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's not good either. All right, okay. Well, General Clapper, thanks very much for the time today. It's been very informative, insightful, and very much appreciated. Well, thanks, Bob, for having me. And, uh, and again, thanks again for, uh, for, uh, for what you do. And uh, thanks for your leadership. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www.oodaloop.com.